Now, using our three steps, let's break this down. This question's asking for incorrect patient statements regarding the key problem, carbidopa and levodopa. So, the key indicator there is dopa. So, remember, it treats Parkinson's disease and helps with uncontrolled muscle movement. The memory trick we use is Parkinson's is unsteady movement, like you're parking a car. A lot of jerky movements and a lot of tremors. Now, they lack the dopamine in the brain, so we think that there's no dope inside the park with Parkinson's. So that's why we give dopa, or levodopa, which leaves the dopamine inside the body, of course, levodopa. Now, the solutions we're looking for are the incorrect remarks by the patient that requires further education. So we're looking for the wrong options here. So option number one is incorrect. We have to skip it, guys, because rugs have a huge fall risk. So making sure to be careful around rugs is good. Remember, we're looking for the wrong options here. Now option two we have to choose because decreasing the tremors, not elimination of all tremors. Again, we're just looking at decreasing the tremors. Now, option three, we have to skip because it's expected that the patient's urine may turn red or brown. And option four and five, we have to choose because it takes several weeks to become effective, just like most drugs that work on the brain. So if you didn't know, dopamine is in the brain. And option number five is incorrect. So we have to choose it. We're looking for the wrong ones here. So we avoid high-protein meals that can interfere with the medication absorption. So just remember, dopamine, we have a lack of dopamine with Parkinson's causing these jerkies. So we have to make sure to give them more dopamine that leaves dopamine inside the body. Okay, that wraps it up. For now using our three steps, let's break this down. This question is asking for which findings for the key problem do you notify the HCP about a patient on sumatriptan order. Now, if you guys didn't even know what that um, drug was, then this question would be pretty hard. So, sumatriptan, we just think that a suma wrestler is sitting on our head because it's given for acute migraines and cluster headaches, causing massive vasoconstriction. So, it's not good for a history of hypertension, and it works on serotonin receptors. So we can't mix with anyone on SSRIs or serotonin antidepressants because it can cause serotonin syndrome. Now the solution we're looking for are reasons why we should not give the meds. So option number one is incorrect. The creatinine level is normal here. Remember, creatinine over 1.3, that's when we get a bad kidney. Now option two is correct here because it's contraindicated with a patient with CAD and hypertension crisis. Remember, this drug causes massive vasoconstriction, like a sumo is sitting on your head. Now, option three is incorrect, because it's okay to take a PAM and LAM ending drug, which is a benzodiazepine. Now, option four is correct. Taking it with an SSRI like sertraline or duloxetine can cause serotonin syndrome. And option five, incorrect, because it's okay to take with weight gain. So, that one is incorrect. Okay, that wraps it up. Now, using our three steps, let's break this down. This question asks, which medication is the antidote for the key problem? The lorazepam. Before looking at the options, we're thinking lorazepam is a benzo that can cause respiratory depression. And the memory trick is Pam and Lamb are driving in that Mercedes Benz. So flumanzanil is the antidote. Now, naloxone is the antidote for opioids. Remember the X's and O's, naloxone puts the O's on the opioid. So the correct option here is flumanzanil for these benzos. So the solution we're looking for is the antidote for the benzos here. So option number one and two are incorrect. 
Acetylcysteine is the antidote for acetaminophen. They sound the same there, so let the name help you. Now, option number two, dimmer caprol is the antidote for metals, which was really interesting because that's really hard to remember. But really, what you should remember for the NCLEX is the antidote for benzos. Option number three, flumanzanil. Now, option number four is incorrect because naloxone is the antidote for the opioid. Remember, the X in naloxone puts the X on the O's in the opioid. Okay, that wraps it up. For more details and test tips, now using our three steps, let's break this down. This question is asking for a priority action for which statement requires more information. For the key problem, patient had an ischemic stroke and is prescribed TPA and the patient makes a statement. So, we're looking here for TPA, which is our clot buster, huge bleed risk. Now we can only give it in a four hour window and we can't give it if the patient had recent surgery about two weeks ago and we can't give it if the patient has a history of a brain bleed or AV malformations inside the brain. The key word there is AV malformations. Now the solution we're looking for is the most concerning contraindication for this TPA or streptokinase. Basically, who dies first with the clot buster? Now, option one was incorrect. Guys, this is a really close one. Technically, the nurse should inquire how many hours ago, but it's not most concerning here. Now, option two and three are also incorrect because warfarin lasts only about five days, so this patient would be a candidate for TPA. And option three, the nurse should acknowledge the patient's billing and should ask about the recent surgery. But really, option number four is the most concerning here, technically the priority. Because knee surgery this month, we need to assess when this patient had the knee surgery. Since TPA is contraindicated for recent surgeries in the last two weeks. So we have to choose option number four as the most priority or the most correct. Okay, that wraps it up. For more details and test tips, please see our rationale below. Now using our three steps, let's break this down. This question is asking for which priority assessment for the key problem do you hold the hydromorphone? Now, before we look at the options, just use the O's in this name of the drug, to know that's the opioid. So guys, look at the O's, hydromorphone. Remember, opioids make everything low and slow. So concerning the ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation, we're thinking respiratory depression. Even if you didn't know what this drug was, guys, always look for the ABCs. Who dies first? So with this, the solution we're looking for is the patient who dies first in this scenario. So option number one and two are incorrect. Elevated temperature is not an indication to hold this med. And option two, history of narcotic abuse may indicate that there's an adjusted dose to be needed, but not a big indication to hold the med. So option three is a priority here because this patient has a respiratory issue. So option three is correct. Decreased respiratory rate, remember, Normal is 12 to 20. Big indication to hold the med, the ABCs here. So remember, opioids make the vitals low and slow, leading to respiratory depression and then death here. Now option four is incorrect because apical heart rate is 60 and not an indication to hold the med. So the correct option is option number three. Okay, that wraps it up. For more details and to Now using our three steps, let's break this down. This question is asking actions to take for the key problem, phenytoin, TID, with a level of 19. So before looking at the options, just think that phenytoin is an anticonvulsant given to ward off seizures the long term here. So the key therapeutic range in terms of numbers is 10 to 20. 
So 19, perfectly fine. So the solution we're looking for are interventions the nurse should do right now for this patient. Now option number one is incorrect because the level is below 20. So no vital signs are needed prior to the administration. Now option two is correct. Keep giving the medications because guys, the levels are within normal limits and the med is used to prevent seizures here. And option three and four are incorrect. The medications within normal limits, there's no indication for more and there's no indication to hold the medication. So for phenytoin, you have to know the therapeutic range and it's almost very similar to all the other therapeutic ranges like theophylline, right? And even vancomycin between that 10 and 20 range there. Okay, that wraps it up. For more details, Now using our three steps, let's break this down. This question is asking for which alerting statement for the key problem, why do you notify the HCP before giving bentropin? So before looking at the options, bentropin is given to treat Parkinson's and it's an anticholinergic, which means it's anti-secretion. So you can't see, you can't pee, you can't spit, and you can't poop. So just think benztropin means you can't pee with benztropin. So no one with glycoma, we can't give it to them because obviously you can't see from the fluid in the eye. And urinary retention like BPH, the patient can't pee. We don't want to add to that. And no one with a bell obstruction, the patient can't poop. So we don't want to add to that. So the solution we're looking for are reasons not to give benztropin. Remember, this patient is dry here. So, option number one and two are incorrect. Shaky hands are a sign and symptom of Parkinson's disease, and really this is the reason why we give the drug. And option two, citrus juice for breakfast, that's okay. We're looking for the dry patients here. Now, option three is correct, because we don't give anticholinergics to patients with BPH. So we call this big prostate that holds back urine. That's our memory trick for BPH. Technically, this patient can't pee, so we can't give them this anti-secretion. That'll make them dry. Now, option four, omeprazole, this PPI for heartburn, that's okay. And option five, we can't give anticholinergics to a patient with glycoma who can't see. So the one who can't pee and the one who can't see Guys, we can't give this anticholinergic, which would be anti-secretion here. So three and five would be correct. Okay, that wraps it up. For more details and test tips, please see our rationale below. Now using our three steps, let's break this down. This question is asking for which assessment findings for the key problem carbidopa and levodopa is working. So before looking at the options, we're thinking those dopas help with dopamine and for treatment of uncontrolled muscle movement. So the memory trick we use is Parkinson's is unsteady movements, kind of like you're parking a car, you have a lot of jerky movements here. So we have a lot of tremor. Now, if you didn't know that, just think DOPA. We're giving this because the patient lacks dopamine. So there's no dope in the park for Parkinson's. So that's why we give DOPA to leave the DOPA inside the body. So remember, leave a DOPA gives more dopamine to the body. So the solution we're looking for are findings that indicate the desired outcome the med is trying to achieve. So option number one and two are incorrect. The patient with Parkinson's does not have any delusion. And there's no syncope with Parkinson's. The big thing with Parkinson's is you're trying to park the car. They have a lot of jerky movements. So option three is correct here. Movements are more controlled. This means that the drug is effective. Now option four is incorrect here because the med doesn't really treat sleepiness. So option three is the most correct. Okay, that wraps it up. For
Now, using our three steps, let's break this down. This question is asking for a priority question to ask for the key problem, the first time going under general anesthesia. So, we're looking at the options. We're thinking, patient has to go to sleep, history of low and slow respiratory status, as well as history of medic medication or allergy medications, and family issues with general anesthesia. These guys, it's their first time. So the solution we're looking for is the most important questions to prevent this worst possible outcome. So option number one is incorrect. Pain tolerance and medication tolerance is good, but guys, not a priority question here. Now option two is the most correct because a family history of problems usually increases the risk for the patient to have an adverse reaction. It could be fatal. Now, option three and four are both incorrect. Nausea after surgery is expected, and allergy to shellfish is related to dyes and contrast, not technically related to anesthesia. Okay, that wraps it up. For more details and... Now, using our three steps, let's break this down. This question is asking for prescriptions to clarify for the key problem. Now, using our three steps, let's break this down. This question is asking for priority info to get key problem, taking St. John's wort. So before you even look at the options, you're already thinking that the memory trick, St. John's wort increases serotonin. So stop St. John's wort with any antidepressants, specifically SSRIs we can never take together. So guys, stop the St. John's wort with antidepressants. So too much serotonin because both will increase serotonin, leading to deadly serotonin syndrome. So the solution we're looking for is the most important info needed for this patient to prevent the worst possible outcome. And I already know the options is going to present an antidepressant. So guys, never mix them. Now, option one and two are incorrect. You can take with bipolar depression, and you can take if you're working outside. Now, option three is correct here. You cannot take the medication with other antidepressants, which can lead to that deadly serotonin syndrome. And lastly, option number four is incorrect. Guys, you can eat tyramine foods with the meds. Remember, only MAOIs you can't mix with tyramine foods. So just remember, St. John's wort, you have to stop the antidepressants. Okay, that wraps it up. For more details and test tips, please see our... Now, using our three steps, let's break this down. This question is asking which med to question regarding the key problem, giving analgesic orders. So before you're looking at the options, we're thinking analgesics makes the vital signs low and slow. So big safety issue, incorrect and incomplete order. So the solution we're looking for are meds that should not be given to the patient here. So option number one is correct. A fentanyl transdermal patch is for chronic pain, not necessarily for acute pain like a surgery. So remember, patches are for persistent pain. The double P is not for acute pain. Now, option two is incorrect because fentanyl in exchange for codeine is appropriate for this patient. Remember, the key is there's no mention of the patch here, so we cool. Now, for the last two options, option three and four, those are both incorrect as well because hydrocortone is appropriate for this patient and morphine is appropriate for this patient as well because of the acute pain. So just remember, option number one is incorrect because patches are for persistent pain, not for acute pain. Okay, that wraps it up. For more details and test tips, please see our rationale below. Now, using our three steps, let's break this down. This question is asking for incorrect patient statements 
regarding the key problem, a scoplamine patch. Now, before looking at the options, a scoplamine patch is an anticholinergic that goes behind the ear and takes time to work. So, scoplamine reduces the secretion, or C, sickness. Now guys, even if you didn't know what this patch was, then just think of the keyword patches here. Now, technically, all patches have to be in a clean, hairless area, and we keep patches away from children. So the solutions we're looking for are incorrect patient statements that need that further education. Now, option one and two are incorrect. Technically, all patches should be placed in a hairless spot, in this case, behind the ear. And option two, all patches should be discarded when they're done, and kept away from children. So those two are correct here. Or I'm sorry, those two are incorrect. So we can't choose them. Remember, we're looking for the wrong options here. So option three, patches can be worn up to three days. That's 72 hours. So that's okay, we have to skip it. So option four, we have to choose because we're looking for the incorrect or the wrong option. So place the patch on before you get on the ship to prevent this C sickness at least four hours before. So we have to choose option number four. Okay, that wraps it up. For more details and test tips, please see our rationale below. Now using our three steps, let's break this down. This question's asking for priority lab results regarding the key problem you're reviewing a bunch of laboratory findings. So before looking at the options, you're thinking priority. So it has to be something regarding ABCs or something that involves safety. So the solution we're looking for are results that have the worst potential outcome for the patient. So really, who dies first or really who's harmed the most here? So option number one is incorrect. Technically, the trough level is normal because Benko is 10 to 20 for a therapeutic range. Now option two is correct here because digoxin is that toxin. So remember, over 2.0 indicates toxicity. So this level is high and the heart rate is below administration parameters. So we can't give or bradycardic. Now option three is also correct. A PTT is high over 90 seconds. Guys, the therapeutic range to know for the NCLEX is 46 to 70 max range. And we stop heparin and notify the HCP as well as prepare the antidote, protamine sulfates, and then you reassess labs in one hour. So always those three. Stop, drop, pick them down, open up, shut, I'm just kidding. So we stop, we notify the HCP, prepare the antidote, and then we always reassess labs. Now, option number four, the BUN is under 20, but the key thing is the creatinine is over 1.3, which means bad kidney. So we have to choose option four. Now, option five and six are incorrect. Theophylline level is normal, under 20. And option six, an increased heart rate after albuterol is normal. Because remember, albuterol, we have the T's, tremors and tachycardia, which is a normal side effect. Okay, that wraps it up. For more details and test tips, please see our rationale below. Now using our three steps, let's break this down. This question is asking which supplement for the key problem treats jet lag and that tiredness. Now we've probably all taken this. So just think, what regulates the sleep cycle? And to help you sleep, we take melatonin, which helps you mellow out and sleep well. So the solution we're looking for is supplement that can help restore the circadian rhythm here. So melatonin. Now option one is incorrect. Ashwagandha is for stress. And option two, this was a pretty good choice, but chamomile tea is good tea to relax and sleep, but it doesn't really regulate sleep cycles here. And option three, also incorrect, 
Magnesium sulfate mellows out the muscles. So we think magnesium mellows the muscles here. So the correct option is option number four, melatonin. Helps to mellow you out and get really good sleep cycles.